Sure. Um, so first, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, great to see everybody. Um, and uh, and it's, it's officially Jewish Standard Time, 12.06, so we can get started. Um, on I will be back uh, on March 21st, Thursday, March 21st, offering a, a lunch. So you get you get two this month, whether you want it or not. Um, and I'll be offering uh, a session on the holiday of Purim. Um, if uh, if Professor Sasson is there, I may be a little bit more intimidated than usual, as he is one of the world's experts in the Book of Esther. But I'll do my best, and and let's hope they don't they don't serve tomatoes. And so you know you won't throw any tomatoes at me if I make any grievous errors. Um, but. Uh, the book, um, we'll look at the book of Esther, we'll look at the holiday of Purim, and the title I've given the session uh, is Finding uh, God in a World Where God Seems Absent, uh, which is one of the themes of Purim, and uh, given everything happening in the world feels like a, an appropriate theme upon which to focus. Um, so you can mark your calendars for March 21st. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to introduce our guest, uh, and I'm going to read the bio that's up here on the screen, and then I'm going to hand out some of her handouts, and then I'm going to sit down and enjoy uh, uh, some lunch um, and also learning. Uh, Rabbi Dr. Sigalit Orr co-leads the Israeli Rabbis Network, a pluralistic network of rabbis from all denominations. Sigalit is a research fellow of the Kogard. Kogard? Kogad Research Center at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. Um, I was a fellow, uh, I'm now a senior fellow at, at Hartman, for, but I studied there for the last four years and was David Hartman Center fellow and a fellow of the third cohort of Maskilot, um, which is the, the feminine plural for, uh, for teachers. Um, and I believe that this was a leadership program for developing um, female scholars within, within Israel. I'll let Sigalit tell you more about that. She's a graduate of the Institute and had Midrashah Oranim Beit Midrash for Israeli rabbis, where she received ordination in 2018, received a PhD in Talmud in Tel from Tel Aviv University, where she received the President of Israel's Scholarship for Excellence and Scientific Innovation. Her dissertation was entitled Dialogues Between Jews and Gentiles in Rabbinic Literature. I would like to actually read this. This sounds fascinating to me. Um, and she teaches a uh, Jewish text and ideas in a variety of venues across the Galilee. Um, wow. And previously, after her work uh, in computer science, R&D, studying networks, if we have any R&D people, uh, IBM Haifa Research Lab and publishing se several research papers and patents, she transitioned into a career um, in informal Jewish education. I will say one other word, which is that... Um, uh, Sigalit is not alone um, existentially um, and also in terms of her visit um, this weekend, uh, there are either this weekend or next weekend, there are 12 uh, Israeli rabbis from what's called the Hartman Rabbinic uh, Israeli uh, Rabbinic Program who are visiting uh, communities all across the United States and Canada um, and really bringing, um, in addition to teachings and scholarship bringing um, experiences, uh, her experiences and the experiences of uh, Israeli rabbis um, in, in providing support uh, to the uh, thousands and thousands of people who were impacted um, by the events of October 7th and continue to be so. Um, and so we feel lucky to, um, to be one of those communities and to strengthen our connection um, with uh, with, with Israel and everything happening there. So I now turn it over to Rabbi Sigalit Or. Yeah, I even need, I even need it lower, I think. Is that okay? Can you hear? Okay, people on the Zoom also, I hope. Okay. So, um, good afternoon. Um, I'm very glad to be here. I flew in last night, and Sabina very kindly drove into the airport to fetch me. 
and uh, is hosting me. Thank you so much. And thank you, Rabbi Daniel, for arranging the visit. And uh, I'm really looking forward to spending the weekend here um, in Durham. I already spent um, a fascinating few hours uh, being uh, shown around the Jewish campus and learning um, about some of the institutions of the community here. And I'm really very impressed. And um, I'm really here to learn. I, I want to, to understand more and to, to bring more of this knowledge back to, um, to Israel. Um, I am, um, in addition to um, all this embarrassing stuff that uh, Rabbi Daniel read, I also want to say that I live in Shorashim. It's a small village up in the north of Israel. Not so far north that we have to be evacuated these days, but um, um, north-ish. I don't know, maybe half an hour's drive north for, up from Nazareth, if that kind of helps people um, locate. And we've had a pretty quiet war so far. Um, but I think an Israeli coming to the States these days to talk, um, one cannot avoid talking about the events of October 7th and what has happened in subsequent months. Um, it's a topic um, that is perhaps um, a little strange to talk about while people are eating lunch, but feel free to eat lunch. I mean, we all need to eat. Um, but there it is. Um, and another thing I want to mention before I start is that um, sometimes people spend the whole time um, trying to detect where my accent is from, and then they don't actually hear what I wanted to say. Um, so I want to put it on the table that I'm Israeli born and bred to Israeli born and bred parents, uh, but my dad loved sabbaticals. So um, I spent um, quite a few years in various English speaking countries, which is why my accent is kind of a mix of all of them. Um, so you can put that aside and now focus on what I actually want to say. Um, and today is March 8th, which is International Women's Day. Um, I um, um, you know, like to celebrate International Women's Day by celebrating all kinds of achievements that women have in various fields. Um, on my Facebook feed now, uh, the feed is all full of... Um, um, talk about a new book that's come out in Israel called Rabot Vetovot. It's hard to translate because it's a play of word, but it's a work by a prominent sociologist about who interviewed um, around 25 um, Israeli women rabbis. Um, and it's, has, it, the book shows how much progress this field has made in the past few decades. And there have been, um, during this week, several events celebrating the book and celebrating International Women's Day. Um, but another thing that happened during this week is that the UN report confirmed what Israelis have been saying ever since October 7, which is that October 7, um, in addition to all the people killed and wounded and savagely attacked, um, also involved um, sexual assaults. Um, against mostly women, but also um, men and, um, and youngsters. And while I don't want to go into the details of what happened, we'll leave that to the UN report. Um, I think um, it's a topic that's worth addressing on International Women's Day. The fact that um, Israeli women uh, were victimized that day. And of course, um, of the 134 hostages still in Gaza, there are 19 women um, that the UN report states are probably like, still being molested or attacked um, in these days too. Um, so as I said, I'm not going to go into the details. Many of us try to avoid the details and trying to maintain our mental health. Um, but what I want to do, and since I'm a Talmud person and a, and a text person, um, I wanted to, um, to read a few texts with you um, and to reflect on how they echo, how they resonate with um, the situation in Israel um, today. And I wanted to start by reading um, a portion of a biblical story that we read in synagogues quite a few months ago. In fact, by coincidence, the original trip was scheduled for November. And the portion, the biblical portion that I wanna read was the portion that we read in November. Um, but the trip was postponed, we're now in March, we've moved forward a book, but I still wanna read part of the story of uh, Shechem and Dina. Um, and I'm looking at uh, 
the so source number one. Um, ignore the, the bit at the, at the top here first. Um, we're going to get to that soon. But I want to read a portion from Genesis 34 um, about uh, Dina, who is a daughter of Jacob, one of the patriarchs, the third patriarch. Um, um, Jacob has had uh, 12 sons. Um, he later changed his name to Israel, and that's why we're called the children of Israel. Um, but he also had at least one daughter, of which we know. Unfortunately, we often don't hear of biblical uh, women. Um, we don't know any of the other names of presumably other ja of Jacob's daughters. We know of her because she was attacked. Um, now, Dina, the daughter whom Leah had born to Jacob, went out to visit the daughters of the land. Shechem, son of Chamo, the Chivi, chief of the country, saw her and took her and lay with her and disgraced her. So basically, we see here a story of abduction and rape. Um, and it's just there flat out. But then, being strongly drawn to Dina, daughter of Jacob, and in love with the maiden, he spoke to the maiden tenderly. So Shechem said to his father, Chamor, get me this girl as a wife. And then the verses that I skipped detail um, a long process of negotiation between um, Shechem and Chamor and Jacob and his sons um, as to what are the terms um, for um, giving him Dina as his wife. Um, the result being that um, the brothers demand that the people of the whole town circumcise themselves. Um, and then they say, if you all circumcise yourselves, then we will be able to become as one, and we will give you our daughters as wives, and you will give us your daughters as, uh, as wives, and we will be able to live together as one community. Um, and um, somehow... I always think it's pretty surprising, but somehow um, they're able to convince the whole town to circumcise in order to do that. And you can imagine um, the scene where the whole town, um, all the men circumcise. I mean, that's one big project. Um, and then I'm, I'm moving to verse, I'm, ju I'm jumping to verse 26, which is right there, uh, the next um, uh, thing on the page. On the third day, when they were in pain, Shimon and Levi, two of Jacob's sons, brothers of Dina, took each his sword, came upon the city unmolested, and slew all the males. They put Chamo and his son Shechem to the sword took Dina out of Shechem's house and went away. Uh, so basically, even though Shechem was the rapist, what uh, the two brothers here do is they kill all the males of the city uh, who are helpless because they've just been circumcised. And um, it's a pretty horrendous example of collective punishment. I mean, Okay, Shechem did a horrible deed, but what about all the others? Why do they deserve uh, this horrible punishment? The other sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the town because their sister had been defiled. They seized their flocks and herds and asses, all that was inside the town and outside, all their wealth, all their children and their wives, all that was in the houses they took as captives and booty. So you see, it's, um, it's an all-out attack. Jacob said to Shimon and Levi, the two brothers who um, originated the massacre, you have brought trouble on me, making me odious among the inhabitants of the land, the Can Canaanites and the Brizites. My fighters are few in number, so that if they unite against me and attack me, I and my house will be destroyed. But they answered, should our sister be treated like a whore? And that's the end of the chapter. Um, with the brother's um, exclamation, should our sister be treated like a whore, sort of resonating and reverberating through the air, and no further comment upon what has just transpired. And we see that Jacob, um, is quite unhappy with what, with what Shimon and Levi have done. But the fact that he's unhappy is not because he thinks it's morally wrong, 
but because he thinks it's tactically unwise. He's saying, look at us, we're a small family here. And if it word comes out that we do things like this, then who knows what people are gonna do to us. Are you crazy? You're a small, uh, we're a small group. We're here in this huge um, land with so many other kinds of peoples. And um, you know, it's dangerous what you're doing. Um, and we don't hear the, the rest of the conversation. What we hear is what we see here in this parasha, except that if we fast forward quite a few years further, um, and in that time, meanwhile, I remind you that uh, Joseph has been sold to Egypt by his brothers, and he uh, went there and he became famous and uh, um, well regarded and um, quite influential. And then the brothers um, come to, uh, to Egypt, and then there's this whole reconciliation scene. At the very end of the book comes a scene where Jacob prophecies slash blesses his children on his deathbed, and all the tribes come um, to hear his words. And so if you turn on um, the page, um, you will see in source number two, um, a few of the, of the verses from that encounter on, on um, Jacob's deathbed between him and his, his sons. And here it says, Shimon and Levi are brothers. Their weapons are tools of lawlessness. Let not my person be included in their council. Let not my being be counted in their assembly. For when angry, they slay a man. And when pleased, they maim an ox. Cursed be their anger so fierce and their wrath so relentless. I will divide them in Jacob, scatter them in Israel. And you see that here, Jacob's condemnation is not tactical. Here he curses them. Here he attacks them. Here he says outright, they um, are, um, are unpredictable. They, their anger is dangerous. Um, so much so that I um, promise them, curse them, that they will be dispersed among, um, among Israel. And indeed, some um, interpreters um, attributes the fact that the tribe of uh, Levi does not have a portion of the land of Israel, uh, but instead are the, um, the Leviim and the Kohanim, the priests, uh, the people who um, uh, perform the temple service but do not actually have um, a piece of land to this curse. And the fact that Shimon, although they did receive a portion of land, were quickly sort of um, integrated into the tribe of Yehuda. So that's the basic biblical story um, that I want to focus on. Um, as you can see, um, it um, echoes in some ways what we've been experiencing in these past few months. Um, the abduction, the attack, um, and also the military response. Um, thank God Israel is not um, uh, intending to uh, kill all the people um, in Gaza, God forbid. Um, we have been accused of doing so, but uh, of planning to do so, but certainly I think this is not the case. Um, but certainly there have been um, voices within Israel saying, if this is what they do to us, then this um, justifies a horrendous response. And this is um, what I want to focus on today. I know it's difficult. I know it's going to the, you know, punching to the gut. Um, I know it's not polite. Um, I know it might be controversial, but I think um, we need to talk about it. And I do look forward to your honest questions and comments um, and we'll leave time for them um, in the end. Um, and I, I, I really look forward to them. Um, I want to show you the direct connection. Turn back your page, please, for a second, and look at the picture on the top. Um, you can see it on the screen um, in color. Um, and it, um, it went around the social networks a couple of months ago. What it is is a piece of paper that somebody wrote a marker on, 
And then basically it's taped um, to, the, to the side of an APC, an armored personnel carrier, an agmash, we call it in Israel. An armored personnel carrier is what carries infantry soldiers into the, into the battle. Um, it's armored, so it's supposed to save them at least, to protect them at least from small arms fire and not from anti-tank um, fire, but from small arms fire. And um, this um, piece of paper was taped to, uh, to the APC. And um, this is what it says. Here in this APC, I, Shimon, and my brother Levi, and our sister Dina, if you see our cousin, the son of that slave, tell him that we're coming. The biblical reference is out there, pretty clear. Um, just to uh, um, uh, complete the biblical reference, I'm sorry I'm making you flip back and forth, but flip your page again and go all the way to the bottom to uh, source number seven from Genesis 21. And uh, we're talking here about Sarah and Abraham. Abraham is the first patriarch, uh, the grandfather of Jacob. And you may remember that like many of the matriarchs, Sarah was not uh, able to have children. And so she solved um, the problem by giving her slave Hagar to Abraham um, as a concubine. And Ishmael was born um, as a result of that. Um, but then uh, Hagar um, insulted Sarah and Sarah told Abraham to banish Hagar and uh, her son Ishmael. At this time, Yitzchak, uh, Sarah's son, had already been born. And so I'm reading from source number seven. Sarah saw the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had born to Abraham. And she said to Abraham, cast out that slave woman and her son. For the son of that slave shall not share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. So I'm flipping back to the uh, picture from the APC. When it says here, the son of that slave, what it's referring to is the biblical story of Sarah's banishment, of Abraham's banishment by, uh, by order of Sarah, of Hagar and Ishmael. And of course, Ishmael um, is the father, the forefather of the Arabs, um, as they also see it, you know, that the story of the Akedah, the, the sacrifice, um, most Muslims uh, say that the son who was sacrificed was Ishmael and not Yitzchak. And so looking at this poem, we see that it's directly referring to these biblical episodes. Um, the episode of uh, Shimon and Levi avenging their sister Dinah's rape and the story of Abraham banishing Ishmael and Hagar so, as he, so that he should not share the inheritance of Abraham with, um, with uh, Yitzchak. There's a third reference that this short um, picture is referring to. And again, we need to um, flip to the other side. Yes, of course. Um, it's interesting the inclusion of, of Dina uh, among the people who are coming for vengeance. Yes, so Rabbi Daniel was asking, um, it's in, was saying that it's interesting that Dina, the sister, is also included in the po in the in this um, in this writing on the ABC. Um, and I want to say perhaps that's because in this war, and this is the first war that this has happened, there are many women Israeli soldiers involved in the fighting. La uh, bless you. Um, there were um, unfortunately several Israeli women soldiers who were killed on October 7. Several of them have been abducted and are still in Gaza as hostages. And there are also women soldiers fighting um, in this conflict. And so at 
the biblical story, Shimon and Levi avenged Dina. What I think this is suggesting is this time around, it's the women also who are taking part in the avenging. Um, APC is armored personnel carrier. Sure. It's also transforming Dina. I mean, it's really transforming Dina from victim to yes to, to avenger the passive into somebody with agency. Thank you for that. Yes, Rabbi Dina is saying it's transforming Dina from being very passive to somebody with agency. She's not just a victim. She's also active in trying to remediate the situation or to avenge the situation, however we want to we want to frame it. Yes. Um, yes, I think you're right. Um, it's a very interesting piece, I think. I mean, I find it very difficult. I, I was shocked when I read it. It took me a while to calm down. And I still think it's a pretty horrible piece, I have to admit. I don't teach it in Israel because I don't think it needs to be spread further than it was. But I feel safe doing it here because I don't think any of you are going to go join the APC. So, so we're good there. But I think it's really interesting to see it this piece here, because I think it's, um, I mean, I'm interested in it because of two things. A, because uh, I think it transmits some of the rage and the, the desire for vengeance and the, I don't even know how to, how to phrase it, um, that I think perhaps in most places has slowly subsided ever since October 7th, but in some sectors is still very much there and is making itself felt in what we see, unfortunately, in some, um, thankfully not a lot, I think, although it's very hard to know what exactly is going on, but um, I think is making itself felt in some places. Just, you know, this, remember the, the resonation of Shall our sister be turned into a whore by uh, by Shimon and Levi? This rage at what was done to us, and I think it's not just talking about the ravagement of the bodies of the Israeli women, but also a, a metaphor for the ravaging of Israel as a collective body on October seven. So that's one interesting thing I think, um, and the other is the way that it so masterfully echoes the traditional texts, because look how short it is, how few words it has, but then it's just pulling in that powerful story about Shimon and Levi and Dina, and it's pulling in this other powerful story about Abraham um, and, and uh, Sarah and Hagar and Ishmael and Yitzchak, and that's how it can encapsulate in such a short few words this whole world of of, of feeling and historical memory and narrative. And, and so that's why I want to show, you, you wanted to comment to, again, do. Yeah. So the other piece about the son of that slave is that it's also Sarah's words, right? Abraham actually is, is bothered by, by Sarah's harshness in that moment. And there, there's something disturbing and but also in terms of international women's day that this is a this is a, a these are words coming out of sarah's mouth yes right, of, of harshness against of, against another woman yes thank you for that um rabbi daniel um points to the fact that um the son of the slave here that's quoted this is quoting sarah's words sarah's harsh words, um, um, telling Abraham to act harshly against Hagar, another woman. Um, and it's interesting that Abraham Davka, because, you know, Ishmael is his son, did not, wasn't very happy about doing, about the banishment, but Sarah makes him do it. And God tells him, you, you listen to your wife, which is a good thing in any case. But, um, but in this case, it means the banishment of, of Hagar and Ishmael. Um, yes. So I just want to clarify what you handed in Genesis 34. There's a big gap. There's Titan 4 and then there's the Yeah, four. yeah. What happens then? Does she, uh, does Dina marry uh, Shechem? 
No, what happened was, I, I tried to, to say precisely, but what happened was that they negotiate. Um, Shem and Hamor want Dina as his wife, um, but the brothers, basically, Jacob hears and he's, he's, we don't hear what he says, but the brothers negotiate with the people of, this, of, the, town, of the, uh, the leadership of the town. They say, we'll accept only if you all get circumcised. And then they all get circumcised. And then that's what enables the massacre, basically. Right, the town um, filled their part of the bargain, but apparently what happened was that it was just a ruse to weaken them, and then that enabled the brothers to come in for the kill. Guess what? Driving at what were Dean's feelings in town? Clearly, after the Harlem situation to start, but sometimes it happened. Yeah, so and are the brothers ignoring her as an agent of her own? So the question here is about what about Dina? And um, and you're right, I skipped all these verses, but had I brought them, I just didn't have a room on the page, you would have seen that Dina is completely voiceless in the whole of the chapter. We do not know what she wants, what she feels, what she's afraid of, um, what she dreams of, nothing, nothing at all. Um, and there's a lot of midrash of later commentary that are, that tries to infuse Dina's thoughts, feeling, actions with a little bit more. There's also a very famous modern midrash called The Red Tent by Anita Diamant, who tries to tell the story from the perspective of Dina. But the biblical text is completely quiet about what she feels about it. Yeah, I just say that actually uh, one of the ways in which you can obtain it like is actually by seizing her. It's, an, it's not an acceptable, but it's a way. And then if you're agreeing to marry her, she becomes a poor only if you do not want to marry her. So basically, there was the statement about their sister becoming poor is not a correct statement. So what Professor Sasson is commenting in, on, interestingly, is that in the ancient world, this was actually an acceptable way of gaining a life. And by the way, up and uh, and up until yeah, yes, and up until this day, by the way, um, in some usually it's it's more ceremonial. Um, in the Cherkessi, the Circassian community in Israel, we have a few Circassian towns. Um, people who were transferred to Israel by, I think, by the Ottoman Empire, um, and who have these small villages up in the north, not far from where I live, um, they still have this method of the bridegroom kidnapping. It's it's ceremonial, but kidnapping the bride on horseback, and then the bride's family negotiating, and so it's a ceremonial remnant of of a, of a custom that existed in practice. Um, in various traditional societies. And what you're saying is that basically had the, the brothers agreed, uh, entered into the agreement in good faith, and had it been carried out in good faith by all sides, then she would not have become a whore, but had become a wife as is accepted. Uh, yeah, we're getting a few questions here. Let's take a couple more and then just, no, go ahead. Let's take a couple more and then we'll we'll go on to the next step, okay? Because I don't want to leave you here. I have a few more things I want to say, but go, yes. I think there's an interesting narrative, different one than you um, presented so far, <laughs> the way we're going there, from an Islamic point of view, which says, okay, we agree, we gave up our identity, and it didn't do any good. So you're talking perhaps about a, a an Islamic perspective backdating it then or, or or trying to bring it forth to this day i'm just trying to text to, to understand before i repeat that there's no help it's it's either we're all going to die one way or another so we might as well have some lives so perhaps you're suggesting the implication is that if we were willing to fulfill our part of the agreement and fulfill our part in the agreement in a very painful way, indeed, and still get massacred, then why bother? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm leaving this as a question. In which they use exactly that 
story has come up with this conclusion ah. that you cannot trust the Jews. So Professor Sasson says that there is a, a Muslim, an Arab novel um, after the 67 war that uses this story to show that you cannot trust the Jews. Fascinating. I didn't know this. Uh, yes. So in, uh, in the verse that, that you just put in, um, the Lord convinces the people to have a circumcision, but he does it in a way that, that he, he, he's basically saying, we're going to, they're very rich. And we're going to get all their riches, and we're going to basically subsume them, not the other way around. And that's part of what the justification is for the end of this. So you correctly um, remind us that the verses that are skipped um, can at least be read to show that the people of the town are really um, aiming to subsume the people of Jacob. That's okay. Um, into that's all right. Thank you. I shouldn't have put it on it. Um, thank you. Um, are, are wanting to subsume the people of Israel into uh, their town to maybe take over their possessions. And so they're not so innocent either. You're transitioning into trying to find uh, the various responses um, and justifications for what's going on. And we'll get there soon, but maybe we'll give Rabbi Daniel if you want. Okay. Just short. First of all, the Circassians have amazing cheeses. So if you ever visit these villages, <clears throat> they're wonderful cheeses. I do want to just say publicly to Jack, as far as I understand, collectively, Jewish tradition has been has differentiated itself by requiring consent. So the it is true that one could marry through sexual intercourse, but I do not I, just publicly, I want to make sure I, I'm not aware of any. A uh, halakhic source that would permit using rape as an instrument to consummate a marriage. Okay, and I just want to make that distinction, uh, and we can talk about it afterward. Or if you if 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 you want to correct me publicly, also that's fine. I just no, it's just the, the commentary of this particular article about whether it is you need to have consent or not. The point that they're trying to make is that an act outside of marriage, before marriage, is an acceptable way to, to consummate marriage. Just yes, but the, the only thing I, I, I'm just publicly as I just want to say, consent is very, very important, right? Uh, and so, I, yes, I, 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 there's, I, a, yeah. there's a very important qualification here by the rabbi. Um, that consent is required to consummate um, a marriage, even if it's consummated by um, uh, by a sexual act and not by uh, the giving of rings or or whatever. There is one exception, but it's not our topic. So, um, so let's not not go deeper into that. Um, I want to show you the third reference that these words are using. And again, you have to flip to the other side, and you see that there's a a, a poem. A Hebrew poem that I, I uh, retained the Hebrew uh, for the Hebrew speakers, but I will read the English translation. It was written by Dan Pagis, who is a Holocaust survivor. Um, and the name of the poem is Written in Pencil in the Sealed Freight Car. Just the name gives you the setting. And the poem says, Here in this carload, I, Eve, Chava, with my son, Abel, Hebel. If you see my older boy, Cain, the son of Adam, tell him that I... That's the end of the poem. Um, in Hebrew, by the way, it means that you can read it cyclically. You can just read that I am here in, and so on. But again, here you see the biblical reference, this time to Cain and Abel, to the first murder, and Adam. And in the context of writing in a pencil on the seal, you know, in a sealed freight car, then it pulls in the whole gamut of, of Holocaust associations. And if you look, at the words on the APC, 
every Israeli high school student has learned this poem. So when they read these words on the APC, that's what they're thinking of. They're thinking of Dan Pakis and the Holocaust associations. They're thinking of Shimon and Levi and the abduction of Dina um, and that whole story of vengeance. They're thinking of Sarah and the banishment of Ishmael and Hagar, um, not wanting to split the inheritance, but wanting to retain it. A heavy stuff. Um, not universally accepted in Israel, I want to say, okay? I, I really wanted, and I, I was, I, I confessed to my fellow delegation members my um, reservations about this, um, this study session because I thought maybe um, I was misrepresenting Israel. I thought maybe I was bringing something that was too harsh, that was too difficult. And I want to say this does not represent Israel. But I think um, it's one stream, perhaps one sector, or I, I don't know if you can say one. I think it's you know it's it's um, it's a it's a way of thought and feeling that is out there among the many others inside of Israel. So I wanted to to bring it to show you that these things um, have these these historical echoes, um, and these these texts are are bringing them here into the fore. Yes. So the question was, in Israel, was there any follow-up with this soldier? Um, there have, has been a lot of criticism leveled at the army for not keeping a much stronger finger on this kind of, um, of activity. And we've seen soldiers writing all kinds of uh, horrible things on, you know, spray painting them in graffiti on walls in Gaza um, and so on. And the army knows it's supposed to crack down on these things. And on occasion, it has done so, um, taking um, people out and, um, you know, firing them and sending them home, which doesn't sound like a big punishment, but is uh, often, I mean, depending on. Um, but the army um, is so overwhelmed, I think, with, with its tasks that it's not doing a good enough job um, at uh, enforcing um, objection to this kind of thing, because it's against army regulations, of course, and it's, it's, not, um, it, it's not something that's accepted. Thank you. It's not a unified thing. Yeah, yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. No, I'm saying that there certainly is a stream in Israel that this that is represented by this. Um, I wanted to bring it. I just want to make sure, um, again, just as as Rabbi Daniel made his qualification about um, about consent, I want to say that um, this is not, I think, representative of the majority of Israelis. It is certainly representative of a minority, and I don't, you know, I I haven't done the the statistics, but of a minority of people in Israel who feel these feelings of rage, of rage and of wanting vengeance um, and, um, and are feeling justified biblically and, and uh, by recent history by their, um, by their actions. Uh, yes. So I think for some people, um, feelings of revenge, et cetera, come out of hurt and fear. But I was listening to the talk this morning, kind of tough thinking about it. There are absolutists, and they're, I think, a different species in some ways, and then there are pragmatists. But the bottom line to the thing I kind of kept thinking about was that um, it was Yair Rosenberg who said, You can't cure the human condition. And I think that's what you can't, what? I'm sorry. You can't cure the human condition. I mean, it's a very general statement, but it really encompasses so much. Yeah, so you're quoting Yair Rosenblum? Yair Rosenberg. Uh, Rosenberg. Write a journalist for the Atlantic. Oh, a journalist for the Atlantic. Sorry, I'm I'm less familiar with the uh, with the uh, journalistic world. Although I did I get send uh, an important um, piece from the Atlantic this week that I still need to read, um, saying that uh, you can't cure the human condition. Um, yes, well, it's difficult for a Zionist to hear that because Zionism is very activist and has been so from its roots, and this feeling I think one of the things that was so difficult for us on October 7th was feeling helpless. And um, since then too, we're not brought up to be helpless. We're brought up to be the antithesis of the helplessness of the Gola, you know? 
the Jews and the Gola, we were brought up to um, to understand, were helpless against the pogroms and, and things. And we Israelis, we're not. We're activists. We do. We fight. We And October 7th, for quite a few hours there, sometimes even days, you know, I have a friend who spent a day holding the door to his safe room so that the, the terrorists wouldn't come in. That just goes against everything we've been brought, been raised on. And it's shocking and it's frightening. And I think it's also some of what's behind things like this. It's just, it's earth shattering. Um, yes, there, there was a question there, yes. So I, what I was wondering, you say this is a, a small, you know, uh, group of people in Israel, but does that group have a lot of political power? I mean, as I see it, I have a lot of uh, people I speak to in Israel and the issue for them, very discouraging about everything, is that they have no control over what's going on, and those people express this kind of, you know, this attitude, this feeling. And so there's a lot of people who are left out. Yeah, so the question was, uh, I said that this represents a minority of people in Israel, but you're co quoting your friends from across the, the, the ocean that say that they feel that these people have a, a disproportionate effect no, on... I'm, I'm saying... Oh, you're saying... Yes, it, whether I feel. I think because of Israel's weird political system, I mean, we all have our weirdnesses in political systems. I'm sure you are aware of your own, but we are also very aware of our own. Um, then yes, I think these people um, have a disproportionate um, hold. I think that this is so earth shattering that I, I do have hope that some, some tremendous change will come that will change the situation because I think more and more Israelis have come out of their complacency and are no longer willing to accept the situation in which um, this is, is is so predominant in Israeli politics. I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, I don't know, it could have been a month or two ago, there were reports in the American news of Israeli soldiers who had videoed a lot of things that were really inappropriate for people in the army to be doing. And that, it was very discouraging because you think of the IDF as being you know, this strong force who are going to do what they have to do. And here it, it, it really reduced that, you know, the idea. It was, it was yeah. very it was embarrassing. And, you know, as a Jew, it really didn't feel good at all to see that. Yes, you're you're relating the disappointment at uh, at some of the videos, the pictures that have been shown of soldiers um, doing things that they should not be doing. Um, I share some of these feelings, um, but I also want to say that without agreeing to some of the things that we've been seeing, I do want to remind us that these are 18-year-old kids um, who share some of these feelings while, uh, you know, you can feel these things and still be in control of yourself, which is what you should be doing. Um, and then also the fighting conditions there are are horribly difficult. I have um, I have three daughters, and this is one of the periods where I'm so thankful that I have daughters, although I do have sons-in-law. And um, but I have a nephew who's very sweet, and he's 21, and he's a tank commander. And he's been in Gaza for months now. He's in the northern border, um, and I don't know how much I can advocate for you know, very, very careful procedures of being, because people have, have died and, and perhaps, perhaps there's no option. I mean, perhaps soldiers need to die in order to save civilian lives. I mean, they, yes, that's, but it's a very murky line there. And we're all thinking of our nephews and our sons and our, so I, I hesitate to, 
we're talking, we're, I, maybe we're mixing two different things here. One thing is the rules of combat, which in Gaza are incredibly complicated. And I, you know, I hesitate to expound on them because I haven't been there and I'm not, I, I'm not risking, you know, a blood family member. And the other is inappropriate and demeaning and embarrassing behavior, which I think should be universally condemned. That's that, that's different. Nonetheless, right. we, we, a lot of Israeli soldiers have been killed, which is a terrible thing for the country and for the families. Yes, it's um, this generation is really really suffering. Um, I, I think you you said this, and and maybe I'm just saying it again because I'm taken by it, but the irony of writing that on an APC, right? Uh, the difference between a train car where you're being led to an extermination camp versus in an APC where you have an army, there is something if I can say almost anti-Zionist about the poem, um, because the poem is claiming a certain victimhood of the Shoah that doesn't recognize you're driving in an APC and you're part of an army. Um, and, you know, in other words, <clears throat> it, it's just that the setting of it is is extraordinary, and the and the. The difference, right, between those between those cars. Yes, yes. So, yeah, yes. Thank you again for that comment. Um, yes, comparing a freight car in the Holocaust to an APC uh, to a soldier in an APC is it's not the same thing, obviously, in terms of agency, in terms of power, in terms of vulnerability and helplessness. We're talking two different worlds here, and the evocation by this APC poem of the Holocaust poem. Um, is almost obscene because you're not there. We're not there. We're, we have an army, we have soldiers, we have weapons, we have allies, we have, it's a totally different situation. I still wanna say, I know factually it's incorrect, but there is a certain feeling of victimhood and it's, it's weird, but it's there within Israeli society, certainly after October 7, also even before, but certainly after October 7, and I'm talking victimhood because of the larger Arab world, because of Iran and the bomb, because of what is perceived incorrectly, I think, as um, insufficient uh, support by the nations of the Western world to um, Israel's predicament. Um, but all these things foster a feeling of victimhood that I think is um, perhaps slightly um, justified, but certainly not to the level of comparing to the Holocaust. Yes. How do we put that explanation of the poem by Dan The poem by Dan Pagis? I forget when it was written. How do I read? Uh, how do I read? Uh, the question is, how do I read the poem by Dan Pagis? I don't even think, I mean, I don't even have a way of saying this is what the poem is saying. I think for me, it feels, and you know, each of us reads, but for me, it feels even almost like a, like a picture, like a freeze frame of a, of a feeling of a situation. And the situation is that it's not just a Jewish mother and child traveling in this freight car to to their death, but it's something about the universal human condition. Um, and quoting Adam and, and Abel and Cain is, is evocating a little bit of that, so. Yes. So the question was, where is this open-endedness leading, open uh, leading us to? Um, I think it's part of this worldlessness um, um, when we look at the Shoah. I mean, what can we say? We have these two brothers, we have this murderer, but we have this mother and this child and they're traveling. And what can we say? It's, it's the human condition on the one hand, but it's the human condition on, 
inexplicable on the other because how can this be happening? How can this? That's what it's leaving empty, what she wants to tell him. Right? Eve and Abel are the Jews, right? It's the mother and they're the victims of the show. I'm not only the Jews, but the, but the Jews. And, and it's a message to the non Jewish world. So Rabbi Daniel is saying maybe um, a Chava and Hevel are the Jews and Cain is, is the non-Jewish world. Um, perhaps, but it's complicated by the fact that Cain is Chava's son and she, she calls him that. So how does that work out? It, it, I don't think there's a, a very simple reading to this poem. Um, it's, I, I, part of, I think part of its beauty is it's very, very much open-endedness. Yes. Correct me if I'm wrong, but as I remember the story, Eve is another voiceless woman in the situation in the context of the murder of Abel. Yes, you're right. Eve is yes, you're right. Eve is another voiceless person in the biblical uh, story in the context of um, I mean, we did hear her voice in the story of the Garden of Eden, but here we do not hear, nor do we hear Adam's voice. What we hear about them is that they go on to have another son. Um, but uh, but in this case, both of them are. Um, she does. Oh, she gives a name to Cain. That's interesting. Yes, thank you. Yes. So I understand the objection that's been raised about the lineage between the poem and what's been written on the ABC, but I think there's another way of looking at it, and that is it's meant to be exactly the opposite. The help helplessness that's expressed on the inside of uh, the cattle car and the extermination of the animals. And the ABC that now we can defend ourselves, now we can give recognition, whatever you want to call it. So I think rather than saying it's the same, it could be that what he's saying is it's completely the opposite. And, and from that standpoint, understanding where he's coming from. Yeah, you're saying you could uh, see it as the same. Um, and then um, comment about the inappropriateness of the of the comparison, but you could also see it as the opposite because um, the original poem has a has a an open ending, whereas this poem has a very clear ending. We're coming, and the coming is in large letters. And so perhaps it's the juxtaposition of these two is trying to say we are no longer um, there in that freight car. This time we're in an APC, and we are coming. Yes. Yes, I agree. Yes. Yeah. So you're trying to get into the the heads of uh, of the Israeli soldiers, and I think I agree that on the one hand there's a lot of guilt. Um, one officer was quoted in the first few days of the war telling the people from the kibbutz that he liberated, sort of. I'm going in to fight and I hope to die because I can't live with myself. And on the other hand, knowing that this war is really impossible morally, you know, there's this term of moral injury. We're going to be seeing massive amounts of that. And it's, it worries me. I'm worried about my nephew, not just because of what might happen to him. You know, there's this midrash about, a, about Yaakov before meeting Esav, his brother, the Yaakov was, was afraid and worried. Two Hebrew words that have, have similar meanings. And Rashi quotes the Midrash, he says, he's afraid of what will happen to him, and he's worried about what he might do to Esav. And there's that dual worry there, for sure. And maybe that what causes part of the anger and the resentment. We'll have to ask a psychologist that. Yes. 
feel like it's important to consider that it was quite possibly written by a scared teenager. For sure, it might be written by a scared teenager, a well-read one, um, a talented one. I mean, I think he's using these these tropes masterfully. Uh, but yes, of course, um, I'm bringing it just because it seems to sort of encapsulate in so few words all these resonating meanings. And I, I'm telling you, when I read it, when I read this, I was scared, um, and I saw that it's not, you know. As I said, I don't think it's a majority, but the fact that this is out there, I'm I'm worried too. See comparison on things like that. The comparison, but on the other hand, it's done so. What can I say? Masterfully. Um, I do want to go back to the biblical story of Shimon and Levi. Because I don't want you leaving, want to leave you with um, with the conclusion that um, Jewish tradition or this biblical story or uh, what we should be learning from or you know whatever you know uh, generalizing um, uh, attitude you could be holding um, is that revenge and collective punishment is what is uh, is an appropriate response for this. Um, first of all, of course, uh, referring just to Jacob's response, um, initially objecting tactically, but then ultimately, towards the end of his life, categorically cursing um, Shimon and Levi, although some interpreters uh, and commentators do find a way out of, of, of that curse, as, as commentators do. Um, but I wanted to read a few um, later commentaries about this story to show a few of the ways um, um, that people have been uh, have been reading this. Um, maybe let's start with source number five. This is Orachaim, Rav Chaim ben Atar from Morocco. Um, and he writes, they will be endangered among the nations if they see that one contemptible man kidnapped the daughter of Yaakov and has his way with her. They will not survive amongst the nations unless they instill terror in the hearts of their enemies so that they tremble before them. Now again, this is again something that you hear in Israel these days. We're small, we're surrounded by an Arab world, and if they are not terror terrorized by us, then every contemptible man will feel that they can have their way with us because we're small. And so Rav Chaim ben Atal here is trying to justify the actions of Shimon and Levi saying, Yaakov was telling them, because you're small, you need to be careful not to antagonize the neighbors. Rav Chaim ben Atal is saying, no, 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 it's quite the opposite. Because you're small, you need to intimidate the neighbors. Otherwise, they'll feel free to do whatever they want to you. Um, so there is, there is that. Um, there's, there's a lot of talk um, in Israel about harta'a. It's one about um, intimidation. Um, it's one part of the, the doctrine of defense um, in Israel. We need to intimidate our neighbors in some way um, in order to prevent them from attacking us. And uh, one fear about October 7 that it, it, that it chipped away. I mean, it basically it broke apart um, any intimidation we may have held against uh, our enemies because if this attack could take place with the army only arriving so many hours after the initial attack, then you know what will that do to Hezbollah in Lebanon and to several others um, all around um, all around us? Um, so again, that's something that you hear. Um, but I do want to see two different commentaries who come at it from, um, from a different perspective. The first is Maimonides, source number three. Um, he's writing in Mishneh Torah, uh, which is his big halachic book. And um, the topic is the Noahide laws, the laws that um, already the Talmud says that not just Jews, but all people around the world um, need to uh, to abide by. Um, and there are seven of these. Uh, they are called the Noahide laws because they are the laws um, that the children, the descendants of Noah, of Noah um, should abide by. 
um, which means everybody because Noach was, you know, her. Um, and um, one of the Noachide commandments is to establish a courts, a loss, a system of law and courts and enforcement and so on. And Raimonides says, how must the Noachites fulfill the commandment to establish laws and courts? They're obligated to set up judges and magistrates in every major city to render judgment concerning these six mitzvot, the other six, and to admonish the people regarding their observance. Um, skipping here a little bit. For this reason, all the inhabitants of Shechem were obligated to die. Shechem kidnapped. They observed and were aware of his deeds, but did not judge him. What Maimonides is saying here is collective punishment is not okay. Vengeance is not okay. But what Maimonides is saying that is happening in the case of Shimon and Levi is not collective punishment and is not vengeance. What he's saying basically is that there are two different sins involved in the story. One sin committed only by Shechem was the sin of rape. But the other sin committed by the rest of the town was not setting up a system of law and enforcement. And says Maimonides, or at least I interpret him to say, if you uphold a society that has no standard of law, that is willing to accept with no comment the behavior of somebody abducting and raping a neighbor, then that in itself consists of, consists and that in itself justifies punishment. Okay, now, how much time passed? We don't know. Um, I, I assume, I mean, but again, this is just my reading of it. I assume it takes some time to convince a whole town to circumcise and perhaps also some time for, for, to recruit all these circumcisers, but you know, uh, there's no, there's no um, mention in the text of how much time passed. And of course, there's a lot of criticism that can be um, directed at this. First, though, I want to say that what it shows us is that Maimonides, the Rambam, does not feel comfortable either with collective punishment or with vengeance. In his eye, if that were the case, if this was the reason why the Shimon and Levi were doing what they did to the people of the town, that would be a crime. Maimonides feels a need to justify what they did, and he comes up with this explanation, I think because he feels uncomfortable with the thought that there's this biblical story that could be read to justify vengeance and or collective punishment. So that's one um, thing that I want to say. Um, the second, I think, bringing this commentary perhaps to modern day Israel and Gaza is that we, of course, know that it's not so simple. I mean, um, Israel is waging a war against Hamas and not against the people, the Palestinian people of Gaza. Uh, but disentangling them um, is difficult and um, requiring or demanding of the people of Gaza to um, um, take to task the, the Hamas terrorists who committed the act is um, problematic. Um, so I don't know how practical this is. Um, I, I just think it's it's interesting to see um, this um, this way of framing the story as um, as punishment um, for a sin for a, for a specific sin and not as just widespread vengeance. The last piece of commentary that I want to read um, is the most ancient. It's from Bereshit Rava, which is um, uh, one of the, oh yes, you want to go for it? Yeah. If it's okay. Sure. Um, in addition to rounding up the circumcisers, um, I also think that there's a, an interesting question about the defend and his relationship to the town. He's, he's the prince, he's not the king. Okay? So his father seems to be tolerating his misbehavior and and the town, you know, there's always a question between it, sort of what sort of leadership do you tolerate, right? Uh, because the, the town is essentially, I, I think Maimonides 
point is strengthened here by the fact that the the the, the, the town is going along with this, right? The town is not revolting against the king and saying, you know, your kid committed the crime, okay? Like, we're not all circumcising ourselves. This is ridiculous, right? Everybody is going along with, you know, it was fine to take Dina and to rape her and, or, and kidnap her and rape her. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and we're all going to, so I think that, that strengthens my mind's approach a little bit. Yeah, so Rabbi Daniel's point was that um, there's this interesting um, play here in terms of leadership and um, and people, where uh, Shem is the prince, he's not the the king or whatever the their their title was, um, and the people of the town seem to be going along with what their leadership is um, is committing and uh, and normalizing and not saying, no, no, we, we won't go along with this. In fact, they're willing to go along with this to such an extent that they're willing to circumcise themselves um, in order to, to legitimize and normalize and you know, bring back into the fold. Um, um, yeah, so, so this is strengthening Maimonides' point because see that the, the people seem to be condoning the actions of their leaders and not um, perhaps out of fear or, but just, yeah, that's what, that's what we do. So the last commentary I want to read is Bereshit Rabba. Bereshit Rabba is um, is uh, was written was probably written in in Israel in what was then called um, whatever, uh, but what is now Israel uh, in the fifth century CE, um, and it notices when it reads the biblical psukim. I'll flip back a little bit um, to show um, in source number two. Um, Verse five, you see that when Jacob is talking about Shimon and Levi, he says Shimon and Levi are brothers. So I'm going to the Midrash and it's quoting the biblical verse, Shimon and Levi are brothers. And the Midrash is asking, what do you mean? Are they not all brothers? Specifically say about Shimon and Levi that they're brothers. And the Midrash con continues, they are brothers in council. They took counsel upon Shechem and killed them. And they took counsel upon Yosef and planned to kill him. And the Midrash goes on to prove its claim. Its claim being that, remember that scene when the brothers have thrown Yosef into the pit and they're discussing what to do with him? What the Midrash is saying is it's not all the brothers who wanted to kill them. And they go along um, and, and explain why this brother didn't and that brother didn't and those brothers didn't, basically sort of pairing away all the brothers until whoever's left is Shimon and Levi. And what they're saying is, Shimon and Levi, they killed all the people of Shechem. They also plotted and planned to kill their own brother. And I think this Midrash is trying to tell us that people who will commit these crimes against others, against people who have victimized us, will eventually, um, may eventually, be willing to kill their own brother. Once violence takes its reign, then you can't really control who is the target of that violence. And sometimes the target of that violence can be their own brothers. And I think um, that's really um, a warning sign for Israeli society that this violence, while we can sometimes understand it, while we can see where it's coming from, while we can identify the feelings and the emotions and the the history and the, the historical memories behind it, um, once it's let unleashed, then it may turn around and be directed inside. And it's um, it's a scary moment, um, a very scary moment. Yeah, 
Yeah, so is, there's a, um, uh, some mention here of the fact that it's doubly dangerous because there's such a division nowadays in Israeli society. There was division even before October 7, um, with the huge demonstrations that took place um, against the judicial reform. And yes, Israeli society is very fragmented these days, and there's a lot of fear of civil war. Um, not civil war, well... I don't think many people envision civil war in terms of, uh, you know, arms and but uh, but the murder of Rabin comes to mind um, and violence in the streets just, you know, which is happening here and there on the verges, you know, uh, people beating up demonstrators and, and so on. No, have gun. No, no, I'm, I'm saying that I don't think people in Israel realistically think that there will be a civil war in terms of Jews, um, you know, platoons of people coming against, like your civil war, God forbid. But in terms of violence turned against um, within society, then that's certainly a fear. And there's a fear that that with, with, with all the violence erupting, uh, with all the soldiers coming back um, from the war, traumatized and so on, that that um, that we we will be pay paying a price for that. Does someone get holding Israeli soldiers to a different level? It would be nuts, but I think the whole Zionist project is to make the Jews active in the world, and they become like other people, and it's a double standard to hold Israeli soldiers. War is war. It's not good. And, you know, we certainly don't want people behaving badly. So, I have to um, yeah, so so your comment is that uh, that Zionism basically the project was to normalize the Jewish people, and in that case, if you're normalizing the Jewish people, then Jewish soldiers are going to behave like any other soldier, which means that they're not always going to be the most morally upstanding and yeah, and you know, willing to to accept um, um, clear and present danger in order to. Um, I have to say that I partly agree with that, but I really I think. I still hold that aspiration for Israel as Jewish state to to up, to to uphold its morals, and 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 it's these days it's so incredibly difficult, but still at least to aspire to. Um, so thank you so much for all your comments and your questions. Uh, I just want to end. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Um, you really gave us a tremendously presentation, so much to think about, so many beautiful sources and just explored so uh, so clearly. Um, and for those who are interested, um, uh, tomorrow morning, uh, Rabbi Segalit will be, um, she'll teach our Mishnah class and then uh, give a Dvar Torah, um, the, the sermon in the main sanctuary, uh, and then also be teaching uh, a shiur, a class uh, afterward, um, after our lunch from one to two o'clock at Bethel um, on the mitzvah, uh, on the commandment to redeem captives. Um, and uh, we are just looking forward to more and more learning with, uh, with you. And we wish... Um, you and your family and your community um and all of israel much much strength um and um and solidarity uh, from our community from afar so shabbat shalom Toda.